Welcome to the Blind Centered Audio Description Chats. These are the edited recordings of the Blind Centered Audio Description Live Chats. The live is the most fun part. We get together, we start with a question, and then we invite up anybody from the audience who wants to come and chat with us, agree, disagree, shed light on something that we hadn't thought about before, which is Nefertiti's favorite. I'm Nefertiti Matos Olivares, and I'm a bilingual professional voiceover artist who specializes in audio description narration. I'm also a fervent cultural access advocate and a community organizer. I'm Cheryl Green, access artist, audio describer, and captioner. And I'm Thomas Reed, host and producer of Read My Mind Radio, voice artist, audio description narrator, consultant, and advocate. Recording now. <laughs> As ever, our approach is that of centering the blind perspective. In this discussion, we will be yielding the mic to blind people. How about we talk about blind-centered, what that means, and what that means to us as the hosts of these chats, but also what that means for the blindness community at large. All right, Thomas, lobbing the ball to you. What is blind-centered? What does it mean? What's that about? Cool. I think I caught it. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, blind centered. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, you know, we've been doing these chats since the, uh, I think toward the end of 22, when I look back, uh, it might have been the summer of 22 when we actually started, but they started posting in the, toward the end of 22. And the idea behind it has always remained the same is that our perspective is that we we believe that when everything about audio description the creation of audio description like any good product should center its targeted audience and while we all know that audio description can serve many different populations that that centered population has been and should always continue to be blind folks I will say, I will try my best to say blind and low vision, but I want you all to know that for me personally, I always included in, when I say blind, I'm including that spectrum, okay? That full spectrum of blindness, which includes low vision from low vision to total blindness. So that's what I mean when I say blind. That's our guiding principle. The fact that the target audience for audio description is blind folks. We use this centering to look at everything about audio description. I think everything, everything about it, everything that goes into the creation. So, so the, for example, the technology that's used to create audio description. If we looked at that, we probably wouldn't have inaccessible software that companies using inaccessible software to create AD. Whatever part of that software, whatever part of that business is, if Targeting, again, censoring blindness, that would mean that it would automatically be accessible. So that's an example of how, how that works, right? The creation, the, the delivery, the process of educating and training those who are producing audio description. Again, blind-centered. Employing and procuring, right? AD. Censoring blindness. That would be fantastic. So I think what we wanted to do today is to take a look at, again, this certification by first framing it with this perspective of blind-centered. So what I mean by that is, like, I think it would be good if we, if we first take maybe five, let's say five issues that are of the greatest concern to blind people when it comes to audio description. What are five things that are the most pressing? I'm specifically talking to blind consumers of audio description that I want to hear from y'all. What do you think are, and you can just throw out one. You don't have to throw out all five. I want to give, give folks a chance. But what are some of the most pressing issues when it comes down to audio description? What are some of the most pressing issues that you feel we face today? There oh, should be as much Catherine. audio description as there is cap as there is captioning. Well, the one of the things I thought of uh, just now is, you know, not interpreting emotions or facial expressions, like just saying what somebody's you know face is doing or 
um, what's physically happening, not, you know, having someone say he looks worried or he's angry, you know, gotcha. it's like, okay. what are they, you know, what's their face doing? Anybody else who identifies as a blind consumer? Yeah, this is Gretchen Mounty. I just want to say uh, quality control. Quality control. Excellent. Oh, that's what I was about to say. I think it's this debate that we're all having, which is fine, about um, t text to speech versus real audio description with narrators, human narrators. And it's the whole thing like some people think, well, it's better than nothing. And uh, it's fine with me. And other people, it's not. And I think how companies, um, I don't want to say <laughs> pick on anyone in particular, but specific companies think it's cheaper and so convenient and we'll give more if, it, if we can just do TDS and it's fine. So far, we have TTS versus human voiced narration. We have quality control, interpretation, mm -hmm. and that we should have as much audio description as there is captioning. Anything else? And a censorship of explicit material, as well as the audio description infrastructure not traveling from one studio to the other. Censorship and pass-through. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do this list, because I was pretty much working on this, and I think we all captured the majority of them. And this is not necessarily in, in any order, but I think many of us would feel that TTS is a, is a high priority, the forcing of TTS on us. <laughs> and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to say it like that. I'm going to collapse some of these into one. When we talk about when Robert mentioned the censorship and all of that, I feel like this is about quality. Yes, and I would some also of this stuff loop goes in into um, interpretation in there as well. Censorship, yeah. interpretation, all of that yeah. goes into quality. And there's a bunch of other things that go into quality that I think we can that we that we talk about and we think about. Um, well written, culturally appropriate, yeah. well casted, all all of that, Absolutely. all of that kind of goes into the quality. So we'll say quality is one, but it equals all of those things. Um, I'm going to go and add significant and meaningful inclusion of blind professionals throughout the process. Aha. Yes. Y'all okay with that one? Oh, Y'all yeah. okay with that? me adding that? Very All right. okay. All right. Cool. I'm going to add this one because I know that this is a thing. We still experience this. The overall experience of theater in theaters and in broadcast and all of that, right? So, so we're talking about the experience. Pass-through, we mentioned the pass-through issue, right? That's part of the experience because the, audio, the AD just never made it there, but we know it exists already, mm -hmm. right? Just never made it there. When you go to a theater and the theater gives you the equipment that doesn't work, that's part of the experience, all of that stuff. When you go to a theater and... The treatment that you receive in that treat in that theater is beyond, you know, it's, it's just not a comfortable experience when, you know, they say, yeah, they have AD on the Tuesday at seven um, one time a month for this one show. And then when you get there, if you can get there, you know, no one really kind of knows what to do. Like, that's not a good experience. Yeah, they have AD. But it's not a good experience. So I'm going to add that right. in on our list because and I that's think that's a really important And for cinema and for live performance. Absolutely. Anywhere that they say they have AD. Right. And then one that I didn't hear, but I think y'all might agree, is increasing awareness among consumers, number one, because y'all know, we here, we're in the know, even if we're just looking at the states right now, but what we're talking about more than the states, there's a lot of people who do not know or are not using audio description who are blind. So I think there's a real effort that's necessary to get this word out to them. But also in terms of getting the word out, increasing awareness among, also amongst content creators. Because we know that if content creators were more involved in the process of creating audio description and looked at it as a creative process, a creative tool, we believe that that would increase both the quantity and the quality. I certainly of believe that. Audio description. Yes. Okay. Cool. I believe cool. that any so content that embraces audio description is enhanced by it. Is enhanced by it. So the content creators need to know about it. So that, that increase of awareness is really, really important. 
it goes beyond those two, but I'm really just kind of talking about those groups specifically, blind people and content creators in the long run, because, you know, one of the things we talk about that would be great for audio description and any form of accessibility is when we accessibility from the beginning of the process, mm. right? So that won't happen. That will never happen until content creators are aware and accept it and view this as an art. We won't get there until that happens. Absolutely. So we have the five things, those five areas. That's the framing that I'm talking about, the blind-centered framing. So these are the things that are pressing to blind folks when it comes to audio description. Okay? So that's, that's what we're going to work with today. So now what I wanted to do was to say, okay, let's use this as the context to sort of look at where the accreditation, the proposed, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's just proposed, but the, the document is serving blind-centered, serving these things. How does it help? How does it help reduce TTS? How does it help increase the number of blind professionals? How does it help increase the awareness of audio description? How does it help the quality of audio, uh, audio description, including all of those issues, including cultural appropriateness, uh, uh, including um, making sure that it's not censoring, um, including how does it help the pass-through issue? Mm -hmm. How does mm -hmm. it help all of that? The impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's kind of how I want to approach this, because we can go through it. And just be like, ah, oh, blah, 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 blah. That's, that's fine. We could do that. But I think to get to that sense of at least my question when it comes to this is, how is this going to help? How is this going to help us as consumers? Absolutely. How does it help us as blind professionals? Yes, exactly. Yeah. How does it impact? How does it benefit? How does it possibly take away from? If anyone has anything specific to point us to where it does address any of these issues, I'm willing to hear that. I, I would love to hear that because that would be probably make this a little faster process. But until that, we'll go through it. Let's just go through it. I'm going to go through a couple of things that I noticed, and, and then we can invite a couple of folks to come up and, and talk about some of the things you noticed. Because maybe you did notice if it does or if it doesn't address any of these five things. And in general, how would it help those who are looking at audio description, description from a blind-centered approach as opposed to something else? I want to go over this one part that I noticed, and we could use this as an example, that I thought was kind of interesting. Okay, so it says, in media and in live performance practice, a cause tries to fit the description into the pauses between the spoken or sung dialogue and critical sound elements. A list of visual elements to describe includes, but not limited to, actions, facial expressions, physical characteristics, body language and gestures, visual comedy and sight gags, dance movements, costumes and clothing, multimedia effects and lighting, settings and scene changes, props, including signage, characters, descriptions. Oh, there we go. There goes something. I mean, that might be some identity stuff might be done. That's kind of low, but it's, it's there, I guess, if that's what that means. Text or on-screen graphics. Okay, cool. Titles, credits, all of that. Oh, why, why is that kind of low, though? The character, the characteristics, if that, if that is, <clears throat> I guess that's identity. Y'all see, Neff, you think that's identity and character? Cheryl, that's identity? Is that, would that be identity stuff? So whether that be disability? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have I, to be, I right? think, no, I don't think, uh, though, at least the item that you read out doesn't rule in or rule out anything, for example, race or ethnicity, skin tone, hair, disability, like you started to say, mobility devices, or is it just, this is the mom? All I can say is that particular item you read out doesn't clearly answer to that. There may be something later in the document. I want to note that both Jolie and Mitchell have hands up. 
Okay. Um, and I wasn't sure if this was the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're about to go to, to Jolie. I just wanted to kick it off. I was starting to kick it off before they had their hands up. So let's go to Jolie. A COD is a certified audio describer specialist. They say can be blind, low vision, or sighted. I love the fact that that starts out with blind, then goes to low vision, then goes sighted. Because normally it would be the other way, and they may say, and in certain circumstances, people who are blind could also blah, 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 blah. But instead, it starts right out with a certified audio describer specialist is a, a person who is blind, low vision, or sighted. I like that. I like that list. Who other than someone who's blind, low vision, or sighted would it include? Exactly, Thomas. Exactly. And so I, I just... Uh, I, when you talk about blind centeredness, I, I think that that's excellent. The stuff, by the way, that, that does cover the idea of um, ethnicity and how to describe uh, different things like skin tone and, and hair and all the rest of that kind of stuff, that's in a different part of the document. But, uh, I, you know, I, I encourage everybody to uh, to read it, um, you know, with, a, with an open heart. Yeah, go. yeah, yeah. So, so I want to get back to that, though, because I think, I think I'm thinking of that line a little differently. I definitely want to point out that it says that. I'm more curious to how does it do it? How does it do oh. it? Because there's lots of things that say things, right? Because what I was getting at is that a person who's doing audio description, from my knowledge, can only be sighted, blind, or low vision. I'm not sure what the other option is. You know, Thomas, I've been in discussions where just to try to get somebody who is sighted to understand that a person who is blind can absolutely do audio description. Yeah. That it's it's not uh, you're editing something that somebody else has said or the people who are cited who are helping you are really doing it and you're just taking credit for it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, I know. have been in those Same. discussions. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was in yeah. one this morning. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I, I think there is an open heart here. Okay. But, but you know, people should make comments and stuff like that because that's what the... The, the group is, is uh, you know, is looking for and, and that kind of stuff. 100%. But, yeah, I, I, liked, I liked that. Cool. Anyway, this makes me nervous, so I'm going to go back and hide out Aww, in, in new land. I hope I'm not making you nervous. I hope it's just the fact that you're talking to other people that make you nervous, not me. I hope it's not me. So. Oh, it would never be you because you have Charles Bernays syndrome and <laughs> your show, that podcast. <laughs> I had that, and I hated it my whole life, Thomas, until I heard your podcast on Charles Bernays syndrome, and I know that's not the subject at all. But now I can sleep because I don't hold those pictures and images and light and stuff against them. And now it's just, as you say, a reverie. It, oh, it awesome. just changed my life. It that's was nice. Awesome. It's nice. Anyway, right. I'm Thank gonna you go for hide. sharing that. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So that's good. So so Jolie looks at that as, um yeah, that that's a blind center because blind was mentioned first. Cool. I can appreciate that. I want to see how, because I think the how is important. I think think this still is related but one thing that stuck uh, out to me was the on-screen text and the reason that this sticks out to me is because there are certain shows for example um survivor where they subtitle english and sometimes it actually can become more difficult to understand what people are saying when two different people are reading the, are saying the exact same thing and i wonder i guess what would be the best way or of like how to go about understanding like because obviously you want to have everything described but also there needs to be some sort of limit are you talking in terms of who should be subtitling who should be narrating that who should be no, voicing that well it's n what i'm more referring to is the when subtitles are narrated by audio description when they're being said relatively clearly by other people and i think that they're subtitled mm. you know, to ensure that people understand what they're saying mm -hmm. but in some ways that can lead to actually more misunderstanding and that's the type of thing we talk about in other blind center chats that we have um okay. blind center ad but here we want to really focus on on that but i i can i can definitely appreciate what you're talking about just real quick i think sometimes you know it, it, it's a it's a call that someone has to make on whether or not to actually go ahead and voice that. And, and to me, that's an access issue, right? Like sometimes yeah. our access issues can uh, be break someone else's access or maybe annoy someone, but you know, someone, a different person is being served by that. So I think we always have to kind of remember that. 
Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. One size does not fit all yeah. cool. when it comes to accessibility. But thank you, Mitchell. Yeah, thank you, Mitchell. I read through the draft criteria, and it is exquisitely detailed. So kudos to the team for covering so many topics and so many angles. I will say, however, that the writing is often very dense and sometimes even academic. And there wasn't, at least in my feeling, a real emphasis on plainer language. Sometimes I have trouble understanding reading and I have to get somebody to read it to me. Or sometimes if writing is very dense, I have to take it and rewrite it in my own words and then cross check and make sure did I get the stuff right. And so there may be some things that I don't understand. So I can't say they're good or negative because the writing of this document sometimes is too hard. And so I wonder if I'm not asking people to answer, but I do wonder if other people have experienced or may experience trouble knowing whether they can get certified or knowing what certification is about because the document is a little bit hard. I will pause and yield the floor to Scott Nixon. I completely agree with Cheryl about the um, the draft. The, the language in it was very, very dense, uh, very, very not necessarily hard to understand for myself because I've had experience with these sorts of documents in the past but a plain language version um i thought would have been a a, a great idea because in, in many cases in you know legislation or things like that in government and so forth they have um you know obligations to have a plain language version that anyone can understand so creating a plain language version of this would be good as well but the main points that I would like to bring up are this, the, going back to the points that Thomas was mentioning at the start um, when I first came in, things like pass through and cultural competency and cultural sensitivity and things like that. I don't think that this is going to really help change much of that um, simply because yeah okay we go we want to create this overarching standard for audio description professionals that is great in theory but which companies are going to sign on to take this certificate or this training or whatever seriously enough to hire people who are going to go through it and once these standards are adopted are they only going to be recognized in the United States or are they going to be recognized in Canada or the United Kingdom or here in Australia? At the end of the day, I in no way mean to harsh anyone's vibe about this great idea that everyone's having. But at the end of the day, at the moment, with no company willing to take it on as a standard, no company saying we expect you to have done this or whatever, it's just another piece of paper. It's just going to be another thing. Okay, great, sure, great to have, but and and it will increase the amount of blind professionals who are out there in the industry. You know, like myself, who you know is a audio description narrator, but it's not going to help with pass through at all. It's not going to help with TTS at all. It's you know, it may help with competency and cultural competency and things like that. How? Scott, yeah. I just want to back up because you, you said that it will increase the amount of blind professionals. How, how do you see that happening with this? Because it's going to be coming through from blind center theory and the information is going to be passed out to people who are blind or have low vision in the community, hopefully, and people who are blind or have low vision will be able to see it and go, okay, well, I'm blind, I have low vision, I think I've got a decent voice, I think I might be able to do this, so... Let's well, this is not about narrators, it. this is not about narrators, it's only about writers and quality control. Oh, right, my, my deepest apologies, I did come in a few minutes late. In that case, scratch that. Okay, we're, ta we're, we're taking that off the table. Quality control, it may help, 
with people who are getting more people who are blind or have low vision to come in for quality control. Script writers, I don't see it working uh, at all. Um, so yeah, like I said, at the end of the day, it's going to just be another piece of paper. And I don't see how without getting all the companies together, all the producers together and saying, okay, we've got this, we want to get more blind people into the industry. They're just going to turn around and say, why? We can do it faster with a sighted person. We can do it faster with a computer or whatever, because at the end of the day, it's coming down to cost. It's coming down to, you know, speed and accuracy. And I don't think this um, this proposal is going to improve standards a whit. It really just comes down to the skills that someone is going to be bringing to the table. And you can teach them all the skills in the world. There are still going to be things that things that slip through and cultural competency. I don't see it happening, you know, at all. So, yeah, that's uh, that's more than two minutes for me. So um, I'll shut up now. But thank you for speaking up, Scott, for sharing with us. I would want to get an understanding of how someone with no experience who's interested in becoming a blind, a blind person who's interested in doing QC. Let's just say QC. Let's not even touch on the writing. But I would really like to know, how would a blind person interested in QC be able to kind of go through this process? Because it seemed like there was a, it was a significant, um, like the, the, the barrier of entry seemed relatively significant to get by. It's really partially because even what Jolie was talking about in terms of getting folks to even be willing I think I think there's that barrier, but then the requirements in here, which I don't have in front of me, but it was you know a hundred hours of this or this and that, and all all of these various things that folks have to take and sign off on, and whatnot, seem like an additional barrier. Plus, if we go into, which is not in here, whatever the cost of the trainings, there's probably a, a dollar level that has to be reached, not only by the training, but then all of the other things that one has to have submit to get this piece of paper. So you said just for the purpose of discussion in this moment, let's think about blind QC and not so much the writing, mm-hmm. just just for right now. The certification looked like you have to have X number of hours in, you know, film or TV, that kind of post-production, and X number of hours in live. If you were in the city where I live, I don't know if blind QC is used in the script writing process in the theater. Now, you know that the stuff that I write and the stuff that I work on in for film, um, we do employ blind QC. But if you lived where I live, I don't know. Is some of the, the live theater describers who I know don't work with blind QC. So for the blind QC specialist who lives in my town who wants to get certified, how on earth are they going to get their hours in the live space if it's not being offered here? I guess remote is the only option. I just wanted to point out something that I read in here that I find, you know, kind of related to what you just said. It says here, when possible, a cause involves audio description patrons and in the design and development of audio description language and encourages the collection and use of patron feedback when possible. I think this should be mandatory. I don't think that when possible should exist because that's the problem. That's the issue that you're talking about right now is that folks leave it, you know, when it's always possible. Blind people are all around the country. And it's not that hard. It's always possible to leave us out. Absolutely. To not include us. And I think making this an option to me isn't blind centered. That's going back to what we started. That's not blind centered for me. Let's go to Mitch. Yeah, I I agree with you on this because I'm personally, as someone who who is um doesn't really live close to any like big cities or whatever, so I can't exactly you know go places for like QC stuff. You have the ability to leave people out, but also the ability to leave people in, and I agree. I think it is very important that this is mandatory. I I just I do think that that's true. 
Um, but I'm also kind of curious in just the in the broader sense of like, you know, like where would you go to to like get who would you contact and who would you contact for when these QC openings opened up? Well, I think that speaks to a little bit about so you go through this training, however much that will cost, you take the exam if there's a cost associated with that. And then will there be a job for you at the end of this? If we've established that companies are not necessarily jumping or chomping at the bit to accept this certification as a means to vouch for someone's competency, then what guarantee is there that there will be a job, Mitchell? It's just a piece of paper. If no one, like, can no one validates it, no it, one believes necessarily. it. It's interesting. Something to think about for sure. Thanks, Mitchell. Glad to help. So we talked about the formatting, the accessibility of the document itself, industry adoption, the fact that blind professionals are, are really barely being hired right now, let alone having to go and get some certification or even just having other things to do to try to get into the industry. Ah, it's just to me, it sounds like another barrier. It really feels like that. I should have said this off the top. This is a critique of the document. This is not a critique of the intention behind the document. It's not, it's not that. Because I think that chances are most people affiliated with this process have good intentions. I believe that. I agree. We're not talking about the intentions. We have to talk about where this is going to lead, and how is this going to help? Again, how is this going to help the quality of AD? How is this going to help the experience? How is it going to impact those five things? And so far, I'm not seeing how it's going to, how it's going to do that. So I wonder if in the last four years that this committee has been meeting, it's a lot of people involved, which is fantastic a lot of perspectives from all over the world, though I must note I did not, and Thomas and Cheryl, if you've picked up on this, let me know, or if someone in the audience has. I didn't notice any involvement from Africa or much, if any at all, in South America, was it? One from South America, none from Central America or Mexico. Central America, ah. I know there were blind folks involved in the process. I don't know how many. Oh, for sure. I'm not sure of how many, but I do recall going through the extensive list, loving the representation, the amount of people at all sorts of levels. What part of that representation are you talking about? Blind specific, but also people from other countries, people that I'm assuming are of color, some. Hmm. I don't know anything about sexual orientation or gender identity, but I'd like to think that uh, that was represented to some degree or another amongst those folks. But it was a, a big swatch, a nice amount of people over the last four years. And I just wonder, what if that time had been put towards these five umbrella-type terms that we've put out here. The quality, the fight against TTS, the awareness of audio description as an option to enhance access. We could put this in context because, um, well, I don't know if it is in context, but it's a, it's a part of it, I think. I think timing is an interesting part because four years, right? So that goes back to 2020. I think of the climate of 2020. <laughs> oh gosh, do we have to? I mean, it's it's a part it's a I think that's context. <sighs> no, it I is. Think it's context, it absolutely right? is. I jest, yeah. but the truth is as much as we may not want to, it has been a tough time on us all. Yeah, but even I mean, if we go back to that and I'm thinking of what was taking place, let, let let's just bring that down to this, right? To to there's yeah. the cultural stuff, right? There's all of that. Yeah. Absolutely. That 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 is a part of this, I believe too in terms of framing, because nothing happens in a void, right? Audio description involves everything. Everything. But specifically, 
2020, there was a lot. That was the that was the beginning to a certain extent of really sort of like this idea of blind professionals. That was 2020. That's when that conversation was really upfront and center. That's when it started. And if it was going back before that, I'm not talking about two people somewhere having a conversation. I'm talking about a community conversation. The audio description community was talking about that. The audio description community was really talking about cultural competence, right? I think that's important. But also, if we look at TTS, TTS was really starting to take place at that time. It was happening, but that was the time that I think we as a community failed to really get a hold on that. So, Neff, when you talk about the amount of effort and, and where some of that effort could have gone that could, be, could really contribute to, the, to audio description, we got to look at the time frame. We have to. 100%. What else was going on? What else were people doing? What else was coming at us? I mean, you know, we, obviously we were in the pandemic and all of that, right? But this came out of during that time. We were having conversations about blind writers. At the same time, this development of AI writing was exploding. So that is also kind of a, a threat to having human writers, blind and non-blind. I don't see that addressed in the certification. It may be in the background, in the committee who wrote these criteria. I kind of wish it was foregrounded, like really openly stated. We don't want AI writing audio description. I want to point out this right here from the document. So it says a cards, a card should not allow personal bias to interfere with communicating the creative intent of the original work. It's a good line, but there's this thing called unconscious bias. When a person is not familiar with their bias, they can't be expected. Cultural competency can't be this checkbox. It cannot no. be this idea that, okay, y'all got to know what you're doing. Recognize your bias. Folks who have bias don't believe they have bias. They don't know it. <laughs> and so until they understand it, they can't do anything about it. What this document doesn't say is who's doing the training for these audio description Correct. folks, right? If there's going to be a certification, that means certain trainers have to be certified. How are they getting trained to teach cultural bias? How are they going to yeah. do that? That's not in How here. are they getting trained? Who's doing the training? And how do you check up on that? Well, quality control. How do you keep up? Quality control. Yeah. But it has to be the full thing. So it's, it's not addressed in here. So just the idea, I just want to get this. This is just my interpretation. But just because words are used in a document doesn't mean that something's being addressed. That said, I would love to hear from people who were involved in making this in putting this proposal together. I really want to hear, and Thomas and Cheryl, you let me know if you agree, but I would love to hear from folks who were part of, like, where the kitchen was, right? I would love to hear from the cooks in the kitchen, if we have any of them amongst us, and you're comfortable speaking. Before we do that, or when we do that, because I am open to that, however, I want to frame that too, because there's no need to, for them to defend anything here, right? Oh, not at but all. But if they could shed some clarity, that's a different thing. If they could put some clarity that's on something, right, want. that that would be fine. But there's no, y'all don't Thank need to come you, up here and say, Thomas. oh, we had great intentions. I, I tried to establish that. I think, you, I think you probably did. I think most of you probably did. I'm an adult. I don't necessarily think everyone is, you know. But who do we have? Yeah, I just had um, the thought that, uh, I mean, it seems possible in theory that, um, you know, the creation, creation of the institution or of certification, the, this gatekeeping, uh, this, com uh, a committee that, uh, uh, has to decide on rule requirements and update them regularly. It just seems like a natural consequence of that would be, uh, more of a community, more, communication and discussion among AD writers and uh, L-SQL, that actually could accelerate the um, 
adoption of progressive ideas. I mean, even if it's not said in in the draft document, um, isn't can we rule out that it wouldn't generate more community? And I mean, do we know there would not be democratic or sensitive to to movements that that support the the, the principles, the goals? Oliver, walk me through a scenario where the certification creates more community. Oliver, I'm not sure if you were here during the beginning, framing that in our blind-centered approach. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm saying specifically with respect to um, these goals like cultural competency, which you would like to see embraced by the AD industry overall, and, you know, which are, are not, you know, percolating through. Um, I think you, one could argue that that's because there isn't really a community of AD writers. But if it, there were a community of AD writers and somebody heard and was persuaded that it was a good idea to be more culturally competent, then they would tell the other people in their community. And maybe that would become a popular idea. And maybe they would talk, they would uh, talk to the member they know that's on the committee and, or they would host their own continuing education um, uh, lecture because continuing education is a requirement in, 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 in certification as I'm familiar with it. Um, so yeah, I am speaking with respect to the particular goals of you know, the five ones. I'm sorry, I can't rattle them all off, but uh, it seems worth considering that this is a way of helping. Absolutely. Thank you, Oliver. I just wanna say really quick, interjecting here, remember folks, your comments, Though we will be sharing this audio and transcripts on the Read My Mind radio podcast, we do highly encourage you to do your own work in commenting directly to the organization. That's comments at acvrep.org, putting in the subject line C-A-U-D-E-S, very important, C-A-U-D-E-S, at comments at acvrep.org. We still have time till March 31st to get your comments in, folks. March 31st, 2024, to get your comments in to the committee or to the ACVREP, I should say, the organization. I will not speak for Cheryl and Thomas, though I'd like to think that um, you join me in this. I would love to hear from folks who were part of putting this together. As Thomas so beautifully said, This is not confrontation. This is not come up here and defend your work. Not at all. We believe that your intentions are good and that overall this is to legitimize audio description as a field, as a practice, as an art form. Though I agree with Thomas, we are all adults here, right? Not all of our intentions are purely good necessarily, but beside all that, I would love to hear from folks, particularly blind folks, right? Blind-centered. Where are the blind folks who were part of putting this together? I just want to, again, encourage any blind folks who are here with us today, who were part of putting this together, who had input, who had a seat at the table, let us know. Please speak to us. How does this all work? How does it come together to improve the quality, the access to the experience whether we got to it here or not today whatever your thoughts are and if you haven't yet or if you want to go over it again that proposal is nice and front and center at the acvrep.org website but to comment that would be comment whether we got to it here or not today whatever your thoughts are And if you haven't yet, or if you want to go over it again, that proposal is nice and front and center at the acvrep.org website. But to comment, that would be comments at acvrep.org with the subject line of, or the includes the word, I should say. And if you just want to make this the subject line, that's fine too. C-A-U-D-E-S. Very important that that be in the subject line. C-A-U-D-E-S. Let them know. 
you know, I feel like this, this just has a different vibe, this whole idea of the certification. It doesn't, it doesn't really feel like it's going to really help. It almost feels like it's a, it's a reversal. It's a reversal a little bit. Like we're going, we're going cordless <laughs> and, and, and this is really putting a, 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 uh, a, a landline back in the house. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a silly joke. But yeah, there we go. But I, I do encourage everybody to, to go ahead and, and whatever they feel, by all means, um, send it in and let's hope for the best. You know what? I'm looking forward to getting a certification because I feel that if I have a certification, I can say to people, you know what? Yeah, I'm blind and I have a certification. I'm a certified audio description specialist or I'm dyslexic. I have trouble with all the, the letters and stuff. And I think it will make a difference. I absolutely encourage everybody to, to read this and comment because they need our comments. Yeah. If we're going to hold people to the fire to or, or, or say say good things or whatever it is, one way or another, it has to be based on, on as you say, authenticity. Thank you for that. And I want to let you know that I hope it works out for you. I really do. And, and for whoever is impacted by that, if that so be. That is truly what I hope for. Because I do want you to have an opportunity. However you get that opportunity, I would love for you to have that. So thank you. Nev, close us out. Just please remember that you do have till the 31st. The 31st of March, 2024, to get your comments in. Be that against, be that for whatever it is. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your effort. And I agree with Thomas, whatever comes of this, we hope it is for the best. After all, this is an art form, audio description for us, by us. It should always be about us. And I can only hope and trust that anything of this kind to legitimize it more or whatever the intentions are, makes it better, improves it, and makes it more open to blind and low vision folks who this is all about, period. All right, everybody. Talk to you at the next chat. Cool. Well, that concludes this week's conversation. Why don't y'all keep the conversation going on social media? Use hashtag ADFUBU for us, by us. Hashtag describe everything and hashtag audio description. And hey, you know we're out here, right? Mm-hmm. Gathered and galvanized, y'all. If you haven't joined us yet, what are you waiting for? You can find us in the LinkedIn audio description group and the AD Twitter community. We know that your participation will only make these spaces better.